Welcome to Fix It Home Improvement, covering projects that every homeowner should know and great products for home and garden. Hi, I'm JC, and this is where we share weekly home improvement tips. I'm here with my co-host, Cindy. Hello, JC. Hi, Cindy. This week, we're going to talk about some common electrical mistakes that homeowners make, and we'd like to thank Merkel 20 for a five-star rating and review on Apple Podcasts. We really appreciate the ratings. And if you've left us a review on another platform, drop us an email and let us know. And also, if you have any topic suggestions, we'd like to thank Player FM for featuring us again on their app. Their podcast app, Home Screen, features new podcasts, and they have search with subcategories to help you narrow your search results for niche content. And you can check them out at player.fm. It's P L A Y E R.fm, or download the app to any smart device. When electricity started to be run into homes in the late 1800s, it was primarily for light sockets. Wiring through the home was commonly knob and tube. You would have cloth insulated wires that were exposed in attics and between the wood framing. They were supported by porcelain knobs to hold them above wood or insulation because the air was cooling these wires. Mm. Porcelain tubes were used to protect the wires when they passed through holes drilled into wood. Okay. The first electrical devices had a plug that would screw into the light socket to get their power. In England, in the late 1800s, they were developing plugs and sockets for electrical devices. One of the first patents for plugs and sockets in the U.S. was in 1903. Grounded outlets started being used in homes in the 1920s, and one of the first references I found requiring grounded outlets in a home was in 1947. Mm Mm-hmm. And the National Electrical Code at the time said new homes are required to have at least one outlet every 20 feet. (laughs) (laughs) And now the spacing for outlets in general areas is every six feet. What do you mean by general area? So that'd be like a living room, a family room, or a bedroom. In kitchens, the spacing is much closer. Okay. I got some tips from Dan Mock at Mr. Sparky. Turn off the power to any circuit that you're working on and confirm it's off with an electrical tester. A shock under certain conditions can be deadly, even at relatively low voltages. If you're making electrical connections for a project, they have to be in an electrical box. The box is designed to help contain sparks and heat from a loose connection or a short circuit, which could cause a fire. When I was investing in real estate in some of these old homes, I found outdoor lights wired without an electrical box, cables connected together wow. with electrical tape rather than <laughs> wire connectors and not in a box, and light sockets in basements and attics wired without an electrical box. Scary. When you're installing an electrical box, it has to be flush with the surface of the drywall to help prevent sparks inside the box from coming in contact with flammable material and causing a fire. Mm-hmm. Another mistake homeowners make is running wire to an electrical box and then cutting the wires too short. This can make it difficult to get a good connection. Right. The wire should extend... You do all that work and you cut it too short. <laughs> yeah, wah, wah, wah. <laughs> So the wire should extend at least three inches out of the box. And if you did cut your wire too short or you open a box and you find short wires, you can extend them with a wire connector and a short length of wire. The push-in wire connectors are easy to use, and they take up less space than traditional wire connectors. Most of them are just square or rectangular, and you just strip a short length of the insulation off and push it into this. Little metal clamps hold the wire. Where a traditional wire connector, you've got to match the connector to the wire gauge and the amount of wires when you're twisting them together. Right. Mr. Sparky recommends adding a 6-inch length of wire to extend short wires and make sure the wire gauge matches the amps of your circuit. 14-gauge wire is for a 15-amp circuit, 12-gauge wire for a 20-amp circuit. Another mistake is not tightening switches or outlets that move when you use them. Mm -hmm. They need to be secured to the electrical box. That constant movement from being used can loosen the screws holding the wires. This can create a small gap between the wire and the screw, 
which can cause arcing, and that can be a fire hazard. And when you tighten up the switch or outlet, if the device is now sunken in below the cover plate, you can purchase plastic spacers at a hardware store or home center. To put in the spacers, you're going to turn off the power to the device. So turn off the breaker to that circuit? Right. And then you're going to remove the cover plate and loosen the screws holding it to the box. You'll slide the spacers under the device and run the screw through the spacer to tighten it to the box. If there's a gap between the electrical box and the front of the drywall, you can purchase a box extender. This has an open front and an open back, and it slides into the electrical box. The top and the bottom have tabs that catch the outside of drywall or the finished material, if you have, like, tile. Mm -hmm. And this is going to create a code-compliant connection that's flush to the drywall or whatever the surface material is, and it's going to give you a tight fit for your switch or your outlet. Box extenders are good when you add tile, paneling, or other material over drywall. Okay. An electrical box can be set back up to a quarter inch with non-combustible material like tile, if it's just exposed where that tile is. Mm -hmm. But it has to be flush on combustible material like paneling or drywall. But check your local code if you're adding a finished material like tile to make sure a space is okay. You can always add a box extender, and that's going to give you a flush fit. Right. If you're in an older home with two prong outlets... So an outlet it, without a prong? Right. And you plan on replacing these outlets with three prong outlets, check that there's a ground wire. Or if you have metal boxes, make sure the metal box is grounded. Otherwise, when you add a three prong outlet, it looks like you have grounded outlets, but they're not grounded, which could be a shock hazard. Mm. You want your outlets to be grounded for safety and for your electrical devices. If you plug a surge protector into an outlet without a ground, it won't protect your electronics or your appliances. So it just becomes a power strip? Right, right, exactly. So a surge protector is absorbing and diverting any surges over 120 volts to the ground wire. Right. If you can't run a ground wire to your service panel to protect against shock hazards, you can replace two-prong outlets with a GFCI. And this will stop the flow of electric in a fraction of a second if there's a shock hazard. It's also going to protect all of the outlets past the GFCI on the load side. Mm -hmm. You're going to have stickers in the GFCI box that says GFCI protected or no equipment ground. And you have to put this on the GFCI and any outlets past the GFCI on the circuit if you replace two-prong with three-prong outlets. And that alerts everyone that the outlet isn't grounded. You can check out Mr. Sparky at MrSparky.com. That's M-I-S-T-E-R-S-P-A-R-K-Y dot com. They have electricians across the country. They're licensed and insured. And the company has a satisfaction guarantee. As long as we're talking about GFCIs, I think a mistake is not upgrading an old home's wiring with either a GFCI outlet or a breaker where they're required. If you're in an older home, you may not have GFCIs in a bathroom, for example. And many towns, when you replace an outlet, you're supposed to replace that outlet with a GFCI if it's required in that area. So, that? so GFCI protection is required over kitchen countertops, in a bathroom, a garage, outside, unfinished basements, crawl spaces, or any outlet within six feet of water. Mm -hmm. And your local code may vary, so you can call your local inspector when you're replacing outlets if you're in an older home. But this is a great upgrade in old homes to protect against a shock hazard, which could potentially be deadly. Right. Another mistake is putting in a ceiling fixture that gets too hot for old wires. Fixtures that are labeled minimum 90 degrees Celsius supply conductors can potentially generate too much heat for old wires. And a lot of the labels will just say MIN90C supply conductors. And I saw this recently on a flush mount ceiling light fixture that I'm putting in at a condo that my son and I are remodeling. The fixture is rated for two 60 watt bulbs. And this has a CSA mark with US under it which means it's been tested and complies with the American National Standard 
and it meets the requirements for the National Fire Protection Association. What is CSA? CSA is the Canadian Standards Association. Well, why didn't you just say that? <laughs> so if you see CSA and it has U.S., it's good for Canada and the U.S. All right. Homes built after 1985 use wire that is rated at 90 degrees Celsius. The insulation surrounding the wire will stand up to 194 degrees Fahrenheit without damage, hmm. where older wires are rated at 60 degrees Celsius, and they can only withstand 140 degrees Fahrenheit. If you put in a ceiling light and use high-watt incandescent bulbs, for example, higher than the watts that the fixture is rated for, the heat could damage the insulation on the wiring in the box and cause arcing between the wires, which could potentially cause a fire, or it could damage the insulation, creating a shock hazard. You always want to limit the bulb to what the fixture is rated at, which is much easier to do now with LED bulbs. Mm -hmm. In my office, I have a floor lamp with a 3,000 lumen LED bulb. This has the same light output as a 200-watt incandescent bulb, but it's only using 25 watts of electricity. Mm -hmm. And I was curious about the heat that this generates. Why? So, <laughs> well, like with that fixture that I'm putting into the condo, two 60-watt right. bulbs is too much heat for older wires. So I was curious how much heat these bulbs are putting out. So I turned this LED on for 10 minutes, and this is the same as like a 200-watt incandescent. Right. After 10 minutes, I turned it off. I used an infrared thermometer, and I shot the surface of the plastic lens, and it was 95 degrees Fahrenheit. And then I tried to find a 60-watt incandescent, mm -hmm. and I don't have any in the house. But I did have a 40-watt incandescent appliance bulb. So I put it in my lamp. I left it on for 10 minutes and turned it off, and I measured the temperature of the glass bulb, and it was 205 degrees. Wow. Which is pretty wild. A 40-watt incandescent is around 400 lumens, and that 25-watt LED that I have is 3,000 lumens, and it's half the temperature output. So if you have an older home and put in LED bulbs in your ceiling light fixtures, it will reduce the heat on the wires in your ceiling electrical box and potentially reduce the risk of a fire. Okay. I still think you need a hobby. <laughs> For older homes, I also like the LED ceiling fixtures with built-in, non-replaceable LEDs. Why? There's no sockets, so you can't put in a high-watt incandescent or halogen bulb, which could potentially be a fire risk. Hmm. Incandescents and halogens can get so hot with high-wattage bulbs that the National Electrical Code no longer allows light sockets without a cover for the bulb in a closet. Really? because it could potentially be a fire risk if those bulbs are too close to clothing. So no more pull chains? Right, right, exactly. Hmm. The new code for a closet is surface or recessed incandescent or LED luminaires that are completely closed, or surface-mounted or recessed fluorescent luminaires rated for closet space. What's a luminaire? It's a complete light fixture with a mounting or fixture strap, a base, a socket, and a cover. That has a special word. Yes, luminaire. <laughs> or it could have a ballast if it's fluorescent, or there could be no socket if it has non-replaceable LEDs. I saw an article from the Pacific Lamp and Supply Company. They said a 100-watt incandescent bulb has a filament temperature of over 4,000 degrees and a surface temperature that can exceed 250 degrees Fahrenheit. Wow. A mistake homeowners can make is not replacing old outlets that don't hold plugs securely. The contacts can bend over time inside an outlet, especially the inexpensive ones. Mm -hmm. If a plug is inserted into the outlet and electricity starts to flow, then that plug moves. It can create a space between the prong and the contacts and cause arcing, which generates tremendous heat. It can melt your outlet and cause a fire. And for most arcing in outlets, it won't trip a standard breaker. That's why the electrical code now requires arc fault protection for new construction and when replacing outlets in many towns. Hmm. The code says kitchens, family rooms, dining rooms, parlors, libraries, dens, bedrooms, sunrooms, recreation rooms, closets, hallways, laundry areas, or similar rooms shall be protected by AFCIs, 
either outlets or breakers. And that's arc fault circuit interrupters. If there's arcing on any of the wires, it will turn off the electric in a fraction of a second to prevent a fire. Mm -hmm. So it makes a much safer home, especially if you're in an older home. A study done by the National Fire Protection Association found between 2010 and 2014, there were over 45,000 home fires involving electrical failure or malfunction, and it caused about 400 deaths a year. Wow. Check out our episode called GFCIs and AFCIs for more detail and tips. I'm sure it was exciting. It was one of our best episodes ever. (laughs) Many homes have switched outlets. Usually one side of the outlet is always on and the other side is controlled by a switch. Mm -hmm. When an outlet is wired like this, the hot side will have two wires going to the brass screws. That's the side with the narrow slots. The other side with the silver screws will have the neutral wire or wires. When you're replacing a switched outlet, you need to break the brass tab that connects the two screws on the hot side. You can use a needle nose pliers and bend it back and forth to snap it off. And this is going to separate the two receptacles. Mm -hmm. If you don't break the tab, your switch won't work. When you're replacing outlets, make sure to wire them properly. The brass screws, the side with the narrow slots, that's the hot side. The silver screws, the side with the wide slots, that's the neutral side. If you have non-metallic cable, your hot wires will be black or red. If you have individual wires run through conduit, the hot wire can be any color except white or green. White is neutral. Green is ground. And with non-metallic cable, the bare wire is ground. Right. If you wire your outlets with the hot and the neutral wires reversed, it can be a shock hazard. Mm -hmm. An outlet tester can be used to check that you wired your outlet properly, and it's a great tool to check all the outlets in your home if it had a previous owner. It's going to test for the most common wiring problems, a disconnected or missing ground, neutral or hot wire, or whether the hot and neutral wires are reversed or the hot and the ground is reversed. Right. Another wiring mistake is putting two wires under one screw terminal on a switch or an outlet You're only allowed to have one wire under a screw terminal. The wires can separate or create a gap that causes arcing. That's a fire hazard. Right. Some devices will have a metal plate under the screw terminal and two holes under the screw, and that way you can push two wires under that plate and tighten them down with the screw. But if you don't have that design and you need to connect two wires to one screw, you would create a pigtail with a six inch long length of wire matching the gauge to your circuit, you would connect the two wires and your pigtail wire under a wire connector, and you would use that one pigtail wire underneath your screw, and that's gonna give you a safe connection. Cool. When you're removing the insulation on wires for a wire connector, make sure no bare wire is exposed. The bare wire needs to be completely in the wire connector, so there's no chance of a short circuit or arcing. And when you're stripping wire for switches or outlets, the bare wire should be completely under the screw and stop at the bottom of the device. You shouldn't have any exposed wire past the switch or an outlet. Right. Some top-rated GFCIs come from Leviton, L-E-V-I-T-O-N, Lutron, L-U-T-R-O-N, G-E, Eaton, E-A-T-O-N, and Pass and Seymour. P-A-S-S, capital S-E-Y-M-O-U-R. Some top-rated AFCIs are from Leviton and Eaton. Some top-rated electrical testers, Klein Tools, K-L-E-I-N, capital T-O-O-L-S, Sperry, S-P-E-R-R-Y, Amprobe, it's A-M-P-R-O-B-E, and Fluke, F-L-U-K-E, Some top-rated wire strippers come from Gardner Bender, G-A-R-D-N-E-R, capital B-E-N-D-E-R, Klein Tools, and Irwin, I-R-W-I-N. Some top-rated screwdrivers come from Craftsman, Milwaukee, Klein Tools, and Weha, which is (laughs) W-I-H-A. 
And headlamps, if you're turning off your electric to an area to do a project, which always turn off the electric to any circuit you're working on. I like headlamps. I know. So some top rated headlamps come from Phoenix, F-E-N-I-X, Coast, C-O-A-S-T, Black Diamond, B-L-A-C-K, capital D-I-A-M-O-N-D, and Wuben. It's W-U-B-E-N. And Wuben has a lightweight cap headlight that rotates. It's pretty cool. (laughs) And headlamps are also handy, not only for home improvement projects, but for camping, hiking, fishing, and emergencies. Yep. Do you have anything else to add? We'd like to thank Mr. Sparky for helping us with this episode. And if you're unsure or uncomfortable with any electrical projects, call a pro because electrical projects can potentially be dangerous. Right. Let's wrap this up. You can subscribe to our podcast on your favorite podcast app. If you enjoyed it, please leave us a review. You can check out our home improvement videos on our YouTube channel, Fix It Home Improvement. And you can subscribe to that as well. You can download our eBooks, Home Improvement Solutions, What Every Homeowner Should Know, Books 1 through 13, and soon, Book 14 on Amazon. If you enjoyed it, please leave us a five-star rating and review. You can email us at fixitpodcast at gmail.com. You can follow Cindy on Twitter at fixitcohost, and you can follow us on Instagram, fixit home improvement. Thank you for listening. Talk to you next week. Deep, 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 deep,